So it's with great pleasure this morning that I welcome our speaker, Sonia Brown. For those of us who have heard her on other occasions, we know that she brings a thoughtful, enlightening, joyful message, very appropriate for the season. Sonia. Good morning, friends, and welcome, welcome, welcome. And thanks, Clive and Vance, for setting the tone of the service. It means so much to me. Friends, this morning, I'd like to share some thoughts on Christmas with you. I believe most of us, if not all of us as children, looked forward to Christmas as a time of giving and receiving gifts, eating Christmas cake and plum pudding, and generally having fun. And if you were like me, you would look forward to eating out the fruits when they were soaking yes. and licking out the battle. Some of us may have gone to church on Christmas Day, but I suspect that some of us, like myself, did not give much thought or any thought at all to the true meaning of Christmas. In the Christmas tradition, Christian tradition, Christmas is usually regarded as the commemoration of the birth of the Master Jesus, which is who is in some Christian churches referred to as Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God. Those of us who were brought up in the Anglican Church will recall the Apostles' Creed, creed which says, I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son. If we believe this, then we are in essence saying that we believe that Jesus was the only Son of God. If so, what does that make us? In our teaching, we recognize that we also are children of God, created by that one source, which is the creator and maker of all things, and who most of us call God. So while we acknowledge Jesus as the great way show, the master teacher, and one whom fully embodied and lived the Christ principle, we also understand that we too are sons and daughters of Almighty God. Dr. Ernest Holmes, who was the founder of this teaching, The Science of Mind, asks the question on page 357 of the Science of Mind textbook, who is the Christ? And he gives the following answer, here I quote. The son begotten of the only father, not the only begotten Son of God, end of quote. You see, friends, God is always begetting. His begetting is eternal. So we too are begotten sons and daughters of God. And since he's always begetting, each one of us is an only begotten child of God in the sense that each one of us is unique. We can liken the Christ principle within us to God's genes. We all have these genes as children of the Most High God. Therefore, I would like to suggest that this Christmas season, while we give thanks and commemorate the birth of the Master Jesus, the great way show and teacher, we also remember, give thanks, and celebrate the Christ within ourselves. So let us see Jesus as our elder brother, that person whom, to the best of our knowledge, 
most embodied and live the principle of universal sonship, Christhood. But let us not forget that universal sonship or daughtership, if you like, resides in each and every one of us. You may ask, how is it that we have not been able to do all the things that Jesus did? The answer is that Jesus embodied fully his father consciousness. He knew himself to be one with the father, whole, perfect, and complete. Infinite wisdom, infinite health, infinite wealth. And he recognized his oneness with all people. Hence, he was able to perform miracles. These miracles were really the manifestation of the perfection of the Father being demonstrated through the people whom he healed. This was possible not because of some magical powers, but because he knew that he was one with them. And as he was whole, perfect, and complete, so were they. He let his light shine, and the people saw his light. Now, you'll recall that Jesus said, greater things than this you can do because I go to my Father. The insinuation here is that the Father is the one doing the work. So therefore, if we go to the Father, we too can allow the Father to do the work through us. To the extent that we embody the Father, to that extent does the light shine through. You see, the Father to whom Jesus referred was not just Jesus' Father. He's also your Father, my Father, and all people's Father. I think we sometimes forget this. So let us remember that we are joint heirs with him, having the same father, and take this time as an opportunity to embrace and embody Christ awareness, Christ realization. To the extent that we do this, we consciously place ourselves under the government of God rather than the government of the world. And each and every one of us can do this. Remember, thou will keep in imperfect peace whose mind is stayed on thee. Quoting from the heart of mysticism by Joel Goldsmith, you yourself must make the transition from being effect to being cause. You must make the transition from being governed by every form of material belief to being God-governed until you are ready to make that transition consciously. You are not yet the child of God. You have not come under the law of God. You have not come under the law of God, the beneficence of God, or the everlasting arms." End of quote. Let me hasten to make this clear. What Mr. Goldsmith is trying to explain to us is that we have to make the conscious decision to move from under the government of the outer world, the government of the material world, to being totally under the government of God. We have to let all our decisions be guided by that one presence and power within, instead of being guided by the outer world. And until we are ready to make that transition, we are not really accepting and expressing in a true way that we are children of the Most High. Yes, we may give lip service to it, but do we deep down believe and understand that we are children of the Most High God? And are we ready and willing to be totally governed by the laws of God? and cease listening to what the outer world is saying? Are we ready to return to the Father's household where everything is already prepared for us? Think of your human father or parent. When we were in our human parents' households, we were governed by their rules, their regulations. 
If we disobeyed these rules and regulations, we more than likely felt the effects of being disobedient. When we moved out of their homes, to a large extent, we were still governed by their rules and regulations because that was the way we had been socialized. And how are these rules and regulations formed? I dare say, to some extent, the rules and regulations which our parents imposed were guided by the social mores and norms, by the consciousness of the race, as we say in religious sense. So what Mr. Goldsmith is really saying is that until we are ready to make the transition from living in the household of the race consciousness, from living in a consciousness of universal mesmerism, we are not yet ready to demonstrate our full being as the children of God. Therefore, we ourselves prevent ourselves from living under the law of God in all its fullness. We do not allow ourselves to fully enjoy the infinite beneficence of God and to be fully supported by the everlasting arms. However, to the extent that we die daily to the universal mesmerism, we embody more and more of the Christ presence within and demonstrate the signs following. So you see, friends, we have within us the ability to be our own saviors, the ability to allow God to express itself fully through us in all its might, power, and glory. Once we recognize and accept that we have it in us to be our own saviors, then we are ready to make the transition to allow the glory of God in all its fullness shine through us. Those of us who were brought up in the Christian tradition were taught that Jesus Christ is our savior. But listen carefully, not just Jesus, but Jesus Christ. That is Jesus the Christ. The operative word here is Christ, the principle of universal sonship. And each of us had that same Christ, Christ spirit within. So to the extent that we embody the Christ spirit, to that extent are we our saviors. Again, quoting from Mr. Goldsmith, the true teacher is one who turns his followers away from himself that they might find the truth in their own being, end of quote. Jesus was a true teacher. He taught that the spirit of truth is within each and every one of us and encourage us to go within to the Father that we might find the truth within our own being. What we have to do is to fully accept his teaching and celebrate him by diligently trying to live by it. The good news is that Christ can be born anew within each and every one of us, each and every day. That is, to the extent that we are able each day to discard some of our human frailties and come into a great awareness of the Christ spirit within, to that extent are we expressing more and more of our Christ selves. How do we embody that Christ spirit? How do we get to that level of God realization where we know that all things are added unto us without willing them to happen or manipulating situations? I believe we can learn a lot about how this is done by looking closely at the metaphysical meaning of the birth of Jesus. For you see, friends, the story of the birth of Jesus can also be regarded as the birth of Christ's realization within each of us. I believe that most of us are familiar with this story. The Gospel according to St. Luke has a part of this story, while the Gospel according to St. Matthew has another part. In the Gospel of Luke, we are told that Mary and Joseph went down to Bethlehem to take part in a census which had been decreed by Caesar Augustus. While in Bethlehem, Mary gave birth to the child Jesus, 
And because there was no room at the inn, the baby was born in a stable and laid to rest in a manger. The Luke version of the story also tells of shepherds tending their sheep at night and being informed of the birth of the baby by an angel. They were also told how they would find the baby. The shepherds hurried to Bethlehem where they found Joseph and Mary and the baby lying in a manger. St. Matthew's version of the story tells of the wise men, King Herod, and the gifts which the wise men brought to the baby. In each of us, there is a Mary and a Joseph. Mary is our pure, maternal, and intuitive nature, which is open and receptive to divine ideas. When Gabriel brought the good news to Mary that she would give birth to the master Jesus, her response was, quoting from St. Luke chapter 1, verse 38, Behold, I am the handmaid of the Lord. Let it be done, but let it be to me according to your word. End of quote. This response signifies a willingness to obey the divine instructions coming from within. It is an illustration of Mary's peaceful consent to spiritual revelation and guidance. She had made herself a vacuum for God in all his fullness to flow through her. She had cast off all fears and concerns and made herself a pure vessel for the Christ. She didn't question the dictates of the Father. She rejoiced in his dictates. You'll remember the Magnificat. Mary says, my soul magnifies the Lord, and my spirit has rejoiced in God, my Savior. The Metaphysical Bible Dictionary says, Mary as virgin symbolizes our feeling nature in a purely intuitive and harmonious state. When we are in harmonious agreement with our inner spiritual, with our inner spiritual revelations and directions, we receive an annunciation of the awakening and quickening of spiritual awareness within us." End of quote. Joseph is our dutiful intellect. While it is difficult for the intellect to give birth to divine ideas, it can nurture and protect them through disciplined spiritual practice. Just as Joseph in the story protected Mary and the Christ child Jesus, Joseph is our rational intellectual thinking. You will recall that the events leading up to the birth of the child Jesus, in, in the events leading up to the birth of the child Jesus, we are told in the gospel according to Matthew the following. Now the birth of Jesus Christ was as follows. After his mother Mary was betrothed to Joseph, before they came together, she was found with child of the Holy Spirit. Then Joseph, her husband, being a just man, and not wanting to make her a public example, was minded to put her away secretly." End of quote. Think about this, friends. Joseph, using the intellect and reasoning and thinking rationally, was wont to separate from Mary, because being a just man, he felt that he needed to do what was right in the eyes of the public. He did not want to make her a public example. We read further on that while he thought about these things, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream, saying, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take to you Mary, your wife. For that which is conceived in her is of the Holy Spirit. Then Joseph, being aroused from sleep, did as the angel of the Lord commanded him and took to him his wife and did not know her till she had brought forth her firstborn son and he called his name Jesus. Angels are messengers of God. 
Our angels are our spiritual perceptive faculties which ever dwell in the presence of the Father. Therefore, although the intellect told Joseph to put Mary away, he was guided by his spiritual perception and followed his spiritual guidance. We too can do this. We can awake from our slumber and allow our spiritual perceptive faculties to guide us. It becomes easier and easier to do this if we use our dutiful intellect to exercise discipline and diligence in attending to our spiritual practices, such as contemplation, meditation, and affirmative prayer. Please allow me to read to you what one of our modern day mystics, Joel Goldsmith, says about practicing these principles. Because I believe what he says is so profound and important. We must know the principles with which we are dealing and bring them to conscious remembrance as often as possible so that in their good time they become the spirit of truth, the consciousness of truth. If we accept these principles even intellectually and are willing to struggle with them for a while, we shall come into spiritual awareness of them and be able to demonstrate and in a measure live them. They can only be demonstrated by you and me individually as we make them so much a part of ourselves through prayer and meditation that they become the comforter and spirit of truth the very Christ itself. And what is the Christ about this very thing that happens to us after we have learned these principles and demonstrated them? It is a life that we begin to lead when we no longer have human desires or human fears, when we have no selfhood that needs glorifying, no selfhood that seeks to find a measure of adequacy by aggressively pushing itself forward. No selfhood that is constantly on the defensive because of a deep-seated feeling of inferiority. Within us will be a conscious awareness of our true identity and of our heritage as the beloved Son of God. Everything that we know secretly and silently within ourselves is revealed outwardly to the world. Whatever it is that we entertain in secret, God rewards openly. End of quote. You will remember that Mary and Joseph had gone to Bethlehem to be included in a census under the decree of Caesar Augusta. We can regard the census as an examination of our beliefs, values, and assumptions. These would quite likely be gained from our socialization and the beliefs of the race. When we examine these beliefs and values, then we are able to do something about them if they differ from what the heart is telling us. That, that is what our essential and true nature is telling us. While in Bethlehem, it was time for Mary to deliver her baby. She had to deliver the baby in a manger because there was no room at the inn I like to think that the significance of being born in a manger has to do with humility of spirit. When the ego is completely out of the way, we have emptied ourselves of all self-will and are able to be pure channels for the Christ principle to express through us. I found an interesting commentary on the web about the innkeeper. Essentially what was said is that the innkeeper may not have intended to be inhospitable. He may have been preoccupied because it was such a busy time in Bethlehem. The inn was full because of the census. The innkeeper was busy and preoccupied and just did not take the time to find Mary and Joseph suitable accommodation. The inn was a gathering place and was probably very noisy. I believe this represents the outer noises that we often listen to, the hype, the various discourses on radio, television, etc., and our tendency to accept these noises as being cast in stone, as being unalterable facts, 
the universal mesmerism, which prevent us from listening to the still small voice within and the inner promptings of the heart. Going into the manger takes us away from these noises. Going into the manger takes us into the heart where we can hear the promptings of the Christ. Let us look at the significance of the shepherds. The story goes that while the shepherds were tending their flock at night, the angel of the Lord appeared to them and told them that a savior, Christ the Lord, had been born in Bethlehem. They went straight to Bethlehem, where they found Mary, Joseph, and the Christ child. So it would appear that the shepherds were the first person to see the child. If we look at the characteristics of shepherds, we see that they live simple lives in close contact with the earth. They are patient, humble, and faithful beings, paying attention to the needs of their flock. Metaphysically, Bethlehem means house of bread. So we may look at the shepherd's journey to Bethlehem as a quest for the true bread of life. The shepherds in their simplicity, humility, and steadfastness of purpose went straight to Bethlehem where they found the true bread of life, the Christ. We too are on a journey. And I believe that we emulate these qualities of the shepherds in our daily practice of living the presence. We will grow in Christ awareness, Christ realization. The story goes that wise men from the East went to Jerusalem reporting that they had seen a star in the East signifying the birth of the king of the Jews. And so they had come to worship him. However, when Herod the king heard this, he was troubled and secretly called the wise men and instructed them to go and search for the young child and bring him back to him so that he could worship him also. The story continues that the star which the wise men had seen in the east went before them till it came and stood over where the young child lay. And we read in the Gospel according to Matthew, and when they had come into the house, they saw the young child with Mary, his mother, and fell down and worshiped him. And when they had opened their treasure, they presented gifts to him, gold, frankincense, and myrrh. Then being divinely warned in a dream that they should not return to Herod, they departed for their own country and not away. Scripturally, the east represents the within. Therefore, the star in the east is the inner light, the intuition, the strong knowing that comes from within. The wise men are the stored up resources of the soul. These resources come to the surface when the inner light dawns. Herod represents the ego. The Metaphysical Bible Dictionary tells us that the ego, which Herod represents, is, here I quote, temporal, because it does not understand man's true origin or the law of man's being. It is narrow, jealous, destructive. Under its rule, man does not fulfill the law of his being, end of quote. How often do we listen to the ego instead of to the inner light? However, like the wise men in the story, we have the ability to disregard what the ego is telling us and allow the divine within us to guide us into another country. The significance of the gifts which the wise men in the story brought to the Christ child is as follows. Gold, riches of spirit, frankincense, the beauty of spirit, Myrrh, the eternity of spirit. So you see, friends, the Christmas story is our story. And as we listen to that inner light within us, we effortlessly express the riches of spirit, the beauty of spirit, and the eternal light. 
Friends, let us go forth and express the Christ spirit and may our days be filled with wonder, love, and peace. Namaste.